Galatians chapter 3. If you got a Bible from an usher, that's page 1076 is where we're going to be. No, 1075. 1075 is where we're going to be this morning, Galatians chapter 3. If you're new this morning, we're making our way through the book of Galatians. We, um, the, the, the issues that Paul describes in, in this book, the first book that he wrote, um, are issues that are just as relevant today as they were almost 2,000 years when this book was ago when this book was written. So um, we need these truths, and so that's why why we're going through this book. We're going through this book slowly to make sure that we, we digest and ingest everything God has for us here. So you should be in Galatians 3 by now. Go ahead and uh, if you're able, please stand in recognition that I am, the words I'm going to be reading are the very words of God and deserve our respect. Galatians 3, starting in verse 1. Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you only this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Does he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of the law or by hearing with faith? just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Know then that it is not those of faith who are sons of Abraham. And the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, and you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed, along with Abraham, the man of faith. Because all for all who rely on works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed, Be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. But the law is not of faith, rather the one who does them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. So that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. That is God's word. You may be seated. As you are, let's pray one more time. God, there are a lot of big, big words in this passage. There are a lot of concepts that that could be foreign for us. I'm so grateful to you for the prayer that Jesus prayed, the, the promise that Jesus made on the night he was betrayed when he told his disciples, that when he left, when he ascended, that he would send the Spirit to be their teacher and their guide into truth. And while that was true for them because they produced the scriptures, that is true for us by application. We benefit when the Spirit opens our eyes to the truth and lets us see wonderful things that are found in your word. He gives us the gift of illumination so that we can understand your word. He guides us into truth. He is our teacher. So God, I pray that your spirit would be here active, powerfully in each of our minds, allowing us to understand how, how, what this truth, what this passage means and, and how this passage relates to our lives. I pray that his ministry would be powerful here. And I want to lift up Cornerstone and Chandler and pray that his ministry would be powerful there. Pray that he would be speaking through Pastor Lynn this morning, that you would make an impact through him into the lives of the the thousands that will be there today, that your truth will be clear, that your son will be honored, that people will be drawn to him because of that and be saved. God, don't just do that in Cornerstone and here. Do that in all of our churches here in the East Valley. We need revival We need a work, a fresh new work of your spirit, whereby we see the dozens of people who are under your curse turn from their sins and be saved. And God, that would be be incredible to witness, but that would be incredible to be a part of, that you would do that in this community. Do it, please. Do it in us. Do it through us. Do it, please, for the glory of your name. Amen. As you guys are getting oriented to the to the scriptures, let me just start by saying that I don't know if it's true in your house, but in my house, the Olymp- the Olympic season is upon us. 
Um, my wife is obsessed with the Olympics, and uh, it is recorded every night. It is watched every night. It is a it is a big deal every every two years. It used to be every four years, yay! But now it's every two years. So, uh, but in the Olympics, we see the the greatness of human achievement. We see the greatness of recognition for human achievement. And these athletes sacrifice, and they train, and they they work, and they sweat, and they push themselves to their very limits to accomplish their goals that they've set for themselves. And and if they by chance should accomplish their goals, then they are put on a pedestal, and 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 are, are some of our most uh, valuable medal is put on them in recognition that they have accomplished something great. The the level is obviously different, but that kind of thinking is exactly the same for our culture, right? From birth, we kind of boast about what we can do, right? I mean, I have a four-year-old and a three-year-old. It's constant. Hey, mama, look at this. Hey, dada, check this out. Watch me. We, from birth, we, we, we want attention. We want recognition. We, we crave it. It, it. It's built into who we are. We, we direct attention to ourselves. We seek validation, approval, acceptance, reward. Society is structured around this, right? When, when you were in school or if you're in school, you know that you, you get recognition based on your performance. You don't just get good grades for showing up. We would all love that, but that's not how it works, right? Performance dictates your, your recognition. Same is true in your jobs, right? Many of your jobs. Your performance dictates your approval. Promotions are achieved by those who perform the best. So this, this is reinforced this, this is with our children. It's reinforced in school. It's reinforced in work so that it's, it's natural for us to crave recognition, to crave approval, accolades, and, and all of that. The human heart thrives on this and craves recognition for our achievements. Now, none of that is um, inherently sinful to do those things, but when we, when we take that mentality into our interaction with God, the results are deadly. Or according to chapter three, verse 10 of Galatians, it produces a curse which means that no one will ever hold up their medals and get recognized by God for their good performance. No one is ever going to be able to stand before the God of the universe and show, or I'm sorry, and get acceptance and praise and recognition from God based on their lives. Nobody, not one person. And it's important to recognize that when when Paul writes this letter to the churches of Galatia, which I've told you before is, is in modern Turkey, these are real people, real churches. When he writes this letter, these, these Christians had come to believe that they must, they must believe in Jesus, give their lives to Jesus, and obey the Old Testament laws, Exodus to Deuteronomy. Believe in Jesus, obey the rules and that will produce their salvation. False teachers had come in, used the Old Testament to convince them of this, which means this, that Paul did not write this book to a group of non-believers, a group of people that don't care about God. He writes this letter to Christians, which means that if they were susceptible to this, then guess what? You are susceptible to this. I am susceptible to this. This is not something removed from us by 2,000 years. This is real every day where you and I are at in our own hearts. In other words, the goal, the goal of Galatians, the goal that, 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 that God through Paul wants to get across to us like he, like he got across to these Christians is that you and I, as a result of this passage this morning, need to doubt that our acceptance with God is based on our obedience. We have to doubt that. We have to come from this text. If you come from the text this morning going, I doubt, I severely, significantly doubt that I can gain my acceptance with God through my obedience, then this passage has done its work in your life. Paul loved these men and women. He loved these churches. He learned that despite his best efforts, they began to think that their acceptance with God was based on their obedience. So what he does, starting in verse 7, verse 8, and going to verse 14, is he unleashes an avalanche of Old Testament texts. Six Old Testament texts in seven verses, using the Old Testament scriptures that the false teachers were using, using those verses against them to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt that there's no hope for anyone who tries to earn their salvation by obedient performance. Now, I've been worried recently about 
about going through the book of Galatians the way we have been is because um, every message might start sounding very similar to the last one. The themes, the ideas are all very similar. And because we're going slowly through Galatians, I thought, well, this, is, this might start to sound repetitive if it hasn't happened already. But then I noticed something. I noticed that Galatians was not three sentences long. God did not like tweet to the Galatians and say, hey, works can't save you. Don't be stupid. Trust Jesus. Three sentences and then he was done. No. He stated works can't save you. He stated salvation is by faith alone. And then he kept saying it over and over, using argument and using the scriptures and using illustrations, doing everything possible to flood, to avalanche this truth into the minds of these Christians so that they would never, ever, ever allow anybody to, to try to convince them that they could be saved by their good works. Well, that's what Paul does again and again and again. And if we are no different, if we are no better than these Galatians, then that's what you and I need again and again and again. To hear that there is a trap laid out there for all of us and we are all vulnerable to that trap. That we will think that somehow, in some way, you, you or I, that we will be good enough for God to go, incredible, incredible that you, I mean, you went to church for 50 straight years and you never missed a Sunday. You served in that kid's ministry. Multiple dozens of kids came to Christ. You gave so much of your mind. You read your Bible so much. That is incredible. I accept you based on that. It is built into our hearts to believe that. And we need that to be destroyed. Now to this text is going to do this morning. So take a look at verse 10, Galatians chapter 3. He wants us to doubt this legalistic tendency. So he starts by saying, verse 10, all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. So Paul's not talking about people who obey God's rules. Obedience is a great thing. It's significant. It's important. It's a necessary thing in the Christian life. But that's, that's Galatians 5. That's not Galatians 3. Galatians 3, Paul is talking about people who trust their own obedience to the law to save them. They, verse 10, rely on the law as a, as a path that, that, that they need to be on in order to be saved. So they think that obedience to the, to the Old Testament laws will, will make them acceptable to God. So their hope, their trust, their confidence in life and death is in their own obedience. Now, as you think about that, you need to realize, as I've reminded you the past couple times, is that most people alive today are on that path, right? Most people, most people believe this. The most of the people you rub shoulders with on a daily basis, the people that you, you love, the people that you know and love best, they are on this path. They, they are on the path that says, all I need to do is be a good person. And as long as I'm a good person, I'm assured of heaven. That should concern you for most of the people you interact with. And the reason that should concern you is that word in verse 10. Look at verse 10. Those who embrace this idea are under a what? A curse. And why does Paul go here with the Galatians? Because false teachers said they needed to believe in Jesus and obey the law to be saved. And Paul's response is like, well, well fine with that. But if you submit yourself to the law, that sets you up to receive all the curses that God says are in that law for disobeying that law. So whether your friends and family know it or not, whether they believe it or not, whether they agree with it or not, all of their obedience, every single thing they've ever done that they think is good will never get them anything good from God, not one thing. They are, like we saw in verses one to five of chapter three, deceived, hypnotized, tricked into thinking that they're on a path that, that sets them up to hear God's, to receive God's blessing and hear his acceptance, they are tricked into that because they are actually on a path that will receive his curses and experience his punishment. See, every second of every day, they live their lives at the base 
of the Mount Everest of God's curse. And it is only a spider web of his grace holding back the avalanche of his wrath against them. That is why Romans 4.15 says, the law brings wrath. The law brings wrath. So this is written so that the Galatians and so that you and I, so that, so that we will severely doubt that God's acceptance of us is based on our obedience to him. And that will happen first at point number one. You admit without sinless obedience, you are cursed. You will begin to severely doubt that your obedience contributes to God's acceptance of you when you admit that without sinless obedience, you are cursed. How do I know this is true? Take a look at the text. Look at verse 10 again. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse for, here's now his proof, for it is written, Cursed be everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to do them. Despite the the rants of some false teachers in our day, the key words in this quote of Deuteronomy 27, 26 are the words, all things, which means that the the, the law is seen here as a complete whole unit. It's not a a patchwork of different ideas. It is one whole unit. It's like a a mirror. If you, you, you break one part of that mirror, you've ruined the whole thing. And that's the idea here. To break one part of the law, James 2.10 says, is to break it all, is to be guilty of all of it. And Deuteronomy makes this clear. We're not gonna go back to Deuteronomy 27, but, but if for, for those of you like Sunday school all-stars, you Bible nerds, you know that Deuteronomy 27 to 30 is a covenant ceremony where, where about 2 million of God's people all, all stood and they, they said, we will follow God's rules. We will commit ourselves to be his people and do what he says. And if you were to read that passage, you would see that they were, they were to write all the words God commanded. That's 613 commandments. They were to write them all down because it says that they were to be careful to do all that God commanded so that he would bless them. And if they, didn't, if they weren't careful to do all that God commanded, he would curse them. There is this comprehensive nature that is, that is built in to this passage. You, you read it, you hear all people doing all the things God said to, to receive all of his blessing and avoid all of his curses. In fact, if you were to read Deuteronomy 27 to 30, you would find about 70 times the word all is used to drive this point home that this is a comprehensive deal. And in fact, six times in Deuteronomy 27 to 30, the people were explicitly told to obey all the words of the law, all of it, not missing anything. So why are most of the people we interact with existing with God's curse hanging over their head, suspended by just the slender hair of his grace? Look at verse 10 again. This is true because as it says there, they did not abide by all things written in the book of the law. They haven't lived up to a standard, which is abiding by all things, meaning no deviations, no aberrations, no moments of nonconformity on the inside, let alone on the outside. And it says in verse 10 that they did not live up to a standard, which is to do all things written in his law, meaning all the moral laws, all the ceremonial laws, all of the, all the dietary restrictions, not missing, not dismissing, not overlooking, not breaking one ever, ever. In other words, God demands perfection, sinless obedience from every person. And if you think, well, that's, that's too high a standard. God sets this standard the very first page of the Bible, right? How many times did Adam and Eve sin before they were kicked out of the garden? Just once, right? One time, one time. In other words, no one can ever hope to live up to perfection. And if that's true, which is Paul's point, then that means all are cursed all are doomed, all are damned, all are lost, all are condemned to eternal hell. Now, some might object in this passage. They might say, well, you know, this is talking about the curse of the law. This isn't talking about the curse of God. This passage has nothing to do with the wrath of God. Ah, but but whose law is it? Is it Moses' law? Whose character is the law a reflection of? The curse of the law is the curse of God because we can't detach the law from God. This is his law. What it says, God says. What it commands, God commands. What it forbids, God forbids. When we violate some verse in here, 
It's not just, well, you know, I disobeyed the Bible. If the Bible is the word of God, then when I disobey the Bible, I, I disobey God. I, I violate him. I, I cross swords with the God of the universe, which is why his, his curse is attached to any failure, past, present, or future, no matter how small, whether it's our actions, our thoughts, our feelings, our motives, all of it. If it does not perfectly conform to God's law, we're cursed. It's like, wow, I came to church to hear that today. That's encouraging. It's going to be. I can promise you that. But what I want you to hear right now, again, is that this isn't, this isn't my opinion. This isn't, uh, this isn't the, the harsh conclusions of some you know, bygone era. This is the reality of God's law. This is his standard, not mine. If it was my standard, my standard would be way lower than perfection based on 613 rules. I can't live up to that. My standard would be way lower. But these aren't my words. This isn't my system. These are the words of your creator. It's really hard to do. It's really hard to do what we're doing right now. But when we treat God's law like a mirror, when we, when we look into his word and we see, okay, this is what it says about my actions, and this is, these are my actions, and we see that there are violations there, it's hard to do because we, we tremble in that moment. I don't want to hear that, and so we move really fast. When, when we hear this threat that if we, we don't keep his law perfectly, we are under a curse that, that melts our heart, that, that makes us feel hopeless, so we don't like that, so we quickly push that away. But if you think about it, if we... If we were to stand before God, we, we wouldn't need a lawyer. We wouldn't need a judge. We, wouldn't need, we really wouldn't need anything. All we would have is our conscience, and our consciences alone would condemn us and prove that we're cursed. So here's the test. Can we all say, not, you know, those wicked people over there, and not, not this side of the room, but, you know, those wicked people over there, can we say, it's not those wicked people over there, but can every one of us raise our hand and say, I am cursed? Try it in your own heart. Say, I have not been sinless. I have not been perfectly obedient. I have no hope of making myself acceptable to God. Instead of being under his blessing, I am under his curse. Can you say that honestly about yourself? If you will not admit that, it's because you still think that your acceptance with God depends on your obedience to God. So Paul wants to address this again. So take a look at verse 11. He says, now it is evident, verse 11, that no one is justified before God by the law. It's evident. It's clear. You have to ask, why is it evident? Why, why is this so clear? It's obvious because the law demands sinless perfection and no one has ever even come close to living up to that. Think about things that are obvious. Um, I exist. It's obvious. If you don't think that's obvious, we need to talk. Like, I exist. You exist. Water is wet. The sky is blue. Two plus two equals four. I break God's laws. Those are all obvious, clear things. Which means this that no one like me who breaks God's laws can possibly be right with God based on a law that I am continually breaking. So how, do, how are we justified? How are we declared right with God? What's the good news? How do we get accepted? Verse 11. It is obvious, evident, that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. The obvious thing is not that the righteous shall live by obedience. It's the righteous shall live by faith. Faith. A person is justified. They're made right with God, accepted by God, not based on doing, but based on believing. That, that word life in verse 11 means eternal life, and it only happens for those who believe. See, this is Habakkuk 2.4, and this is another one of those um, verses in the Old Testament that tower over the rest because they're one of the few places that where the Old Testament teaches that, that salvation, that being accepted by God is based on faith. Now, Paul writes verse 11 so that the Galatians and so that you and I will clearly doubt that God's acceptance of us is based on our obedience. So that will happen for you and me if point number two, we begin to remove all our hope for God's acceptance from ourselves. 
Remove all your hope for God's acceptance from yourself. All of it. All of it. In other words, true saving faith begins not with closing our eyes and crossing our fingers and you know, wishing upon a star. Belief begins when a person has no more hope in himself. When it is clear to him that he could never be justified by the works of the law, like it says in verse 11. When it is clear to him that like everyone else, he cannot do the thing that no one else has been able to do, which is obey God perfectly. And this is where Paul goes in verse 12. He says, but the law is not of faith. They are mutually exclusive. Rather, the one who does them shall live by them. So look at verse 11, the righteous shall live by faith. Verse 12, the one who does them shall live by them. So uh, Leviticus 18.5 is the verse that he quotes here. And then this is a promise. And the promise is this. If you do the law, you will live forever. If you do the law, you'll live forever. Anyone want to sign up for that? Anybody want to get on that treadmill? Start running? No one? No one at all? That's good. That's good. You know what that means? It means that there's hope it means that, that that hope in yourself is being removed. That image of you as a good person is being shattered. It's not heresy to say that God will accept anyone who obeys him without sin. It's not heresy, it's just hopeless. It's impossible for any one of us to achieve. Leviticus 18.5 is a, is a wonderful promise, but what good is it going to do us if the standard of achieving life through obedience is perfection? No, God's word says something differently. Look, look back. Uh, go, just turn to one, one uh, chapter to the left in, in Galatians 2. Look at verse 16. It's, Paul is showing that there are two paths. You can either be on the path that says doing achieves eternal life, or you can be on the path that says faith receives eternal life. There, there are only these two paths. And so, Paul, this is something he's been going over in this book, Galatians 2.16. Halfway through the verse, it says a person is is justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by the works of the law, no one will be justified. This is what God's word says in Romans 3, 21 and 22, that the righteousness of God, being right with God forever, has been manifested apart from the law. That God has shown us, this is how you can be right for me, but it is completely apart from the law. How, how, how is a person made right? Romans 3, 22, by faith. This is what God's word says in Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. It says, by grace, you've been saved through faith. And this grace, this faith, this salvation is not your own doing. It does not, it cannot depend on you. It's a gift from God, not a result of works. After going through this, after seeing what these verses teach, we should have no hope whatsoever in our ability to be accepted by God through our obedience. Salvation is close when we renounce ourselves, when our hope is not in ourselves, when we refuse to trust that we are good enough for God, when we let these truths, when we stop pushing these truths away and fold our arms and go, that's not true, even though it is clearly right there. Salvation is close because we're saying, no, I'm gonna be done with me. But your hope might be this. Well, surely this is the Old Testament. The New Testament is different. You know, it's, it's all about love. And Jesus is kinder and gentler than the Old Testament. He's, he's much nicer than Moses. His standard must be lower. Okay, let's take a look at his standard. Keep your fingers here in Galatians 3. Turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. First book of the New Testament. Jesus is talking about the standard for being right with God. He's saying, you, you've heard that this was the standard, but I, I say to you, you, you you've, you've read that the standard is, is do not murder, but I tell you that if you, if you are, are angry with someone, it's as if you've committed murder already. You've heard the standard is don't commit adultery, but, but I say to you that if you've looked on someone with lust in your heart, it's as if you committed adultery already. He's showing that the standard goes beyond our actions to our intentions to our emotions, to our, to our secret thoughts. Well, what is the standard? He, he summarizes it at the end of chapter five. Take a look at verse 48. 
What is the standard of acceptance with God? You must be what? Perfect. Perfect in your actions, perfect in your thoughts, perfect in your feelings, perfect in your desires, perfect in your doing. You must be perfect. And what's the standard of perfection that he lays down for all of us? As who? As your heavenly father is perfect. The standard for acceptance with God is the same perfection that God has. When Jesus explains God's standard for acceptance, he is equally hopeless. Perfection, sinless obedience, no exceptions, past, present, future. To be accepted by the perfect God, you too must be perfect. In other words, we are just as cursed and just as hopeless here from the lips of Jesus as we are from the Old Testament. Well, turn back to Galatians chapter three. Another person might say, well, my hope is, you know, I'm, I'm a very good person. I, I have kept many, many of God's rules. I've, I have tried hard to do that. Sure, great. It's a good thing to obey God's rules, but it is not a good thing to obey them to earn God's acceptance. Notice the text. Look back at chapter three, verse 10. It does not say, abide by many things and doing them. It says, abide by all things written in the book of the law and do them. So great. I mean, the issue is not, are you a very good person, one of the best people on the planet? That's fantastic. The issue is, are you perfect like God? Have you done all that God commanded? So you were never a murderer, but have you lied? So you were, you were never an adulterer. But did you covet people's stuff? Well, you were, you were never a thief, but did you dishonor your parents? You never worshiped idols, but have you taken God's name in vain, used it as a cuss word and not with the respect that it deserves? See, somewhere in God's law, it proves that you too, though a very, very good person, are indeed cursed. Well, another might hope, well, I'm no worse than the people around me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just like everybody else. Great. Spurgeon put it this way, to be cursed with a crowd around you is no better than being cursed all by yourself. This hell will not be any less tolerable for you because you were better than the others who are burning there with you. God won't justify you based on the sins of others. He will, he will justify you based on yours alone. God doesn't compare you to others. Doesn't give a rip about other people's. Uh, standards compared to yours. He doesn't compare you to other people. He compares you to his law and asks, are you perfect? He compares you to his law and said, have, has, have you abided by all things written in this book? He compares you to himself and says, are you perfect like me? Again, there, there is no hope in the actions of others. There is no hope in your obedience. Without perfect sinless obedience, you too are cursed, just like me. But still another might hope, uh, I'm, I'm not perfect, but I've done my best to obey God. I've done my very best. I've, I've tried as hard as I can. Let's think about that for a second. Like, you've done your best? Like, you sure about that? You telling me that there was never one occasion when you could have done better than you did? Not one time that you could have chosen to escape the temptation rather than giving into it? I think if we're honest, hundreds, if not thousands of times, we, we could have done what was right, but we did what was wrong. I, think we, I, think, I, don't think we've, I don't think you and I have ever done our best to obey God, ever. I think if we're honest, we, we haven't even come close to doing our best on one occasion, let alone on every occasion. See, at the end of the day, all of the things we hope in fade away. And we realize, no, like I said before, I am cursed. Because the, the law is like this. Picture a wall. And on that wall, it says, get past me and you will have eternal life. Okay, got that in your mind? So you see that wall one day and you're like, okay, that's no big deal. And you start to walk towards one side. Only the wall starts to grow. No matter how fast you run, that wall goes faster. So you think, I'm going to get in a car and I'm going to try, and it just keeps getting, 
faster. So you go the opposite direction. It starts growing in that direction. So you get in a train and it gets faster. You get in the fastest jet on the planet and it continues to go faster. So you can never get around it. You think, well, I can't get around it, so maybe I can go over it. So you get in a rocket and you you shoot up as far as you can go. But no matter how far you go in that rocket, that wall is still higher than you and you can't get over it. Well, you think, maybe I can just go through it. So you get all of the all of the the explosives and all of the, the stuff that can take that wall down and you ignite it and you notice it doesn't even make a dent in the wall. You think, well... I got to climb it. So you start to climb the wall, but you realize that the wall is covered in this thick, slimy gook. So you can't even begin, you can't even get a, a, a handhold, let alone a foothold, and even try to make it after your first step. You realize I have no hope. And it says on the other side of this wall is eternal life and blessing forever. That is what it means to trust in the law of God to save you. There is no hope in you being a good person There is no hope in you being good enough to make God acceptable to you. There is not a chance that you have. But out there, there are two paths. And both of those paths say heaven. One of them says you achieve it through law. And the other one says you receive it by faith. Both promise eternal life. Both promise God's acceptance. These paths are parallel. So they they look like they're both going in the same direction, but because they're parallel, they never intersect. They're mutually exclusive. And in fact, they are vehemently opposed to one another because one leads to blessing and the other leads to cursing. When it comes to being right with God, uh, doing contradicts believing. Trusting is opposed to obeying. Works is against faith. Faith nullifies works as the way that anyone achieves acceptance with God. One path says earn God's favor. The other one says, God will be favorable to you when you are done with yourself and you believe. If we are cursed, if there is no hope in ourselves, if if acceptance with God is impossible for for us, then what hope do we possibly have? Look at verse 13. Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. The impossible has happened. Hope is found and it's not in us, it's in Christ. He has broken through that wall. He has destroyed that wall and he says, come to me and you will have the acceptance. Come to me and you will be right with God. It is not found in your doing. It is found in trusting me. See, by now, the Galatians should have rejected everything the false teachers told them. They should have unequivocally doubted that God's acceptance depends on their obedience. And here's the thing. You should too. God accepting you depends on Christ, not you. We looked at the bad news. We looked at God's curse on all men, verses 10 to 12. Now we see verses 13 and 14, God placed his curse on one man, the Lord Jesus Christ, that he took the curse of the law, the curse that falls on all who disobey the law. He became that curse for us. The curse is reversed in him, not us. Jesus took our curse when he hung on the cross and look at the rest of verse 13. He redeems us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. Paul is quoting Deuteronomy 21, 23, but here's the thing. When when, when Moses wrote this verse, crucifixion hadn't been invented yet. So being hung on a tree had nothing to do with execution. In fact, in, in Old Testament Israel, what would happen is that a person would be executed through whatever way chosen, and then their body would be hung on a tree. And the hanging on a tree would be a symbolic representation that this person, because of their disobedience, received the curses of God. So the body was hanged on the tree after the person was executed. It's a visual representation. This is what it looks like to be under God's curse for disobedience. So when a person hangs on a tree, according to Deuteronomy 21:23, it proved that they were cursed. Now, we know exactly when Jesus was cursed, right? 
I want you to see this. Turn back to Mark 15. Mark 15, if you got a Bible from an usher, that's page 945. Mark 15. I go into much more detail on this. Uh, you can see it on our website. You can go to it in the, in the series on Mark 15. I want to, I want to take you to the, to the moment when Jesus was cursed. So by the time we get to this passage, Jesus has been on the cross for three hours. He's been brutalized and tortured. He's been nailed to a cross. He's alive. He's experiencing some of the most intense pain anyone's ever experienced. And then it gets worse. Jesus becomes our curse. Look at verse 33. And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So we're talking from noon until three, the most bright part of the day, and it becomes black. This darkness is not natural. This darkness is supernatural. Darkness does not mean that God was absent. That's what people think. Well, God forsook him, so he left. That is not true. The darkness means that God was present in judgment. Darkness symbolizes the divine curse being unleashed. Darkness is the most intense kind of God's presence in judgment. The darkness is a preview of the judgment God is going to pour out on the whole unbelieving world. But instead of pouring it on, on the whole world in this moment, he poured it all out on Christ. Why did the darkness last for three hours? Because that's how long it took for Jesus to become sin. That is, that is how long it took for him to suffer the eternal curse for those sins. This is the infinite wrath of God being absorbed by the infinite son of God, and it took three hours. Then the, the ultimate curse for the one who only enjoyed the sweetest, most perfect friendship with God is, happens in verse 34. And at the ninth hour, 3 p.m., Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama, Sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is the worst, most ultimate expression of the curse, being abandoned by the one that his perfect soul loved most. His Abba becomes his executioner. For three hours, Jesus endures the wrath of God. For three hours, he was abandoned by God. For three hours, he became a curse. Three hours, the father crushed his son over and over and over, and then it stopped because he died. Now turn back to Galatians 3. Verse 13 took three hours. And in those three hours, he became our curse. And Paul brings the Galatians back to that moment. And he brings us back to that moment so that we will forever doubt that God's acceptance of us is based on our obedience. But instead, you will not trust your obedience anymore when point number three, you transfer all your hope for God's acceptance to Jesus. Transfer all your hope for God's acceptance to Jesus. This is just another way of saying that God's acceptance of you is based on faith, not works. Not faith in yourselves, not faith in your resume of goodness, not faith in your feelings, but faith in Jesus. Now we'll look at this in more depth on Wednesday nights coming up, not this week, but next week. But for now, I want you to see that, that this passage ends with some incredible truth, some incredible realities that happen the very second a person is saved. What happens the, the very second a person believes in Jesus? We can see this five blessings in this passage, and with this we'll close. The first blessing is this, substitution. Don't miss those two words in the middle of verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. These are some of the most beautiful words in the universe. Don't ever forget that this is the heart of Christianity, the heart of the gospel, the heart of the good news, the thing that this whole thing is all about. And the thing that this whole thing is all about is substitution. For us, he became our curse. 
For us, he was nailed to the cross. For us, he bled and died. For us, he was abandoned. The cross was done in our place, on our behalf, as our substitute, as the curse was relocated from hanging over our head to being pummeled, crushed onto the head of Christ. Just believe. Just believe. The second thing that happens in that second is redemption. Redemption. Look at verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The word used here means to purchase something. It, this, this word was used for slaves who, would, who could save up enough money to buy themselves out of slavery and into freedom. So Jesus buys us out of slavery to sin and death and hell and judgment. He buys us from, from the curse of the law. He removes us from that, and he does that with his precious blood. Just believe, and that will be true of you. Third is justification. Take a look at verse 13 again. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Drop down to verse 14, so that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles. What is the blessing of Abraham? In context, the blessing of Abraham is justification. Let's look at verse eight again. Galatians 3, eight says, in the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel beforehand to Abraham. So there it is, the blessing of Abraham. Look at verse, uh, verse five, I'm sorry, verse six. Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. What is the blessing that Abraham experienced? It was the righteousness of God. It was God saying, you are right with me. You are accepted forever. That that, that was true for Abraham now goes to all people everywhere. Why? They just believe. He will accept anyone. He will accept anyone as if they were Christ himself. God will declare them right with him forever, just as right with him as Jesus is right with God. God will declare you right with him forever. If you just believe. Fourth is, is regeneration. As justification, forth is regeneration. Take a look at verse 13 again. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Drop down to the middle of 14. So that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. The promise of the spirit living within the believer is proof that the new covenant has dawned. And what happens in the new covenant is that our sins are washed away. He awakens us from spiritual death. He opens our spiritual eyes. He gives us eternal life. He, he is the spirit of life. He takes up residence within us. And, and with him, resident in our hearts, he is the down payment. He is the proof that the salvation he started in our lives, God will complete guaranteed. That promise is yours. That, that new life is yours. If you just believe and fifth and finally, the blessing that happens the moment you believe is union. All this happens, verse 14, in Christ Jesus. Every spiritual blessing, Hebrews 1, 3, is located in Christ. The atonement that he made for you as the substitute is in Christ. The redemption, the rescuing you from slavery to sin is in Christ. The justification, the declaring you forever uh, accepted by God, is hap it happens in Christ. Regeneration, new spiritual life, new creation is in Christ. All this and much more is in Christ. The question for all of us is, are you in Christ? Are you in Christ where all of these blessings are? You are not if you do not decisively doubt that you can earn your acceptance with God by your obedience. If you still think you can experience redemption, justification, regeneration apart from substitution and union, then you are still cursed. You are acting as if you don't need Jesus to be your substitute because you're good. 
You can achieve your, or your, you can free yourself from slavery to sin. You can make yourself acceptable to God. You can give yourself new life. I hope that going through Galatians 3, 10 to 14, that you, you now realize that trying to gain your acceptance with God by obedience to God is like uh, trying to get refreshment from an empty water bottle. It's like trying to find money in an empty wallet. It's like trying to find life in a graveyard. It's trying to find light in darkness. It's trying to find warmth in the snow. There is no hope there. Keep all your hope in yourself and your own goodness, your ability to be good enough for God to accept you, and you will never transfer your trust to the only one that can make you acceptable to God. It's only there where there's blessing and forgiveness and acceptance forever. Well, you know, I'm not sure about this. And just remember, verse 10 is your biography right now. All who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. Are you in Christ? Flee to Christ. Rely on Christ. Give your life to Christ. And you'll be redeemed. You'll be justified. You'll be given new life and you'll be united to him forever. Just believe. Let's pray. Jesus, I often pray this, but it is true every week. There are no accidents in this room. You specifically wanted everyone in this room to hear this message, including myself. So help us understand why. Open our eyes to see the things that you have prepared for us in this word this morning. Soften our hard hearts. Weaken our crossed arms. Cause us, please, to do business with you. Jesus, thank you for leaving no part of the curse left over for us. Thank you for taking it all. Thank you for becoming a curse for us. Thank you for redeeming us, being our substitute and receiving everything that we deserve for all of our crimes against God's law. Thank you for being treated as if you lived our lives so we can be treated as if we lived your life forever. May you be honored and may we leave here more in love with you and more desiring to live for you as a result of the truth we saw about you this morning, Jesus. In your name I pray, amen.